Good morning, and welcome to All Saints Church in Worcester, Massachusetts on this July 12th Sunday. I invite you to participate in our service as much as you feel comfortable doing so in the reading of the prayers, the singing of the hymns, and when it comes time to receive communion, I invite you to have also at your own home uh, wine and bread or juice and to receive communion when I do. It's summer, and as summer gets hotter, it gets hotter in this building, and I can assure you that it's very warm in here. And that impacts some of how we do the service. Uh, fewer vestments uh, on the altar, um, fewer vestments on the altar as well, how we arrange things in the sanctuary, and it gives a sense of movement of liturgical seasons. And um, again, I invite your, your questions or your comments as you observe these differences and what the, how that impacts our service. Because it's summer also, people don't always watch church Sunday mornings, and that's fine. Some of these services are recorded, so if you would like to see them later in the week on Facebook, uh, on our webpage, or on our new YouTube channel, I invite you to do so, but also invite other people that you may think would enjoy these services. Invite them to join or to watch. Send them a link. And our service begins. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to His glory. For God can be great, Almighty God and Father. We worship You, we give You thanks, we praise You for Your glory, Lord Jesus. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you, and grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do, and also may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. And now we'll have some readings from Scripture. A reading from the book of Genesis. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padan Aram, sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is to be this, very, this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided 
The one shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. When her time came to give birth, there, <laughs> there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle. So they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. While Jacob was a quiet man living in tents, Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was famished. He said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stuff, for I am famished. Therefore he was called Edom. Jacob said, First, sell me your birthright. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. The word of the Lord. Psalm 65, verses 9 through 14. We will read these in unison. You visit the earth and water it abundantly. You make it very plenteous. The river of God is full of water. You prepare the grain, for so you provide for the earth. You drench the furrows and smooth out the ridges. With heavy rain, you soften the ground and bless its increase. You crown the year with your goodness and your paths overflow with plenty. May the fields of the wilderness be rich for grazing and the hills be clothed with joy. May the meadows cover themselves with flocks and the valleys cloak themselves with grain. Let them shout for joy and sing. A reading from Romans. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son, the likeness of sinful flesh, and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the, on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are sinned, who are in the flesh, cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit. Since the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It is God who saves 
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. The Gospel of the Lord. Today we have a guest preacher, someone that you will all know and recognize, the Right Reverend Bishop Mark Beckwith. Good morning. I want to begin by thanking Bernie Poppy for inviting me to preach here this morning, a place which has great meaning and, and merit for me. I was rector here for 14 years at All Saints Church, and the church is empty at this moment, but in some measure it's filled with the memories, the relationships, the spirit that is so much a part of this place, and I'm grateful for that. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of all our hearts, be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The book of Genesis from which the first lesson is taken this morning is in large measure a long case file of an extended family. It tells the story of this family over several generations it's not a confidential case file. We've had access to it for thousands of years. We've been reading from it and learning with it. And part of the case file, the good news of the case file, is it doesn't redact 
the reality of this family story. It doesn't airbrush out the greed, the deceit, the betrayal, the dis- all the dysfunction that this family carried. This morning we hear the story of a new generation. Two twins born to Rebecca and Isaiah, Isaac. Rebecca's been barren for a long time, so she's excited. She doesn't know that we, she's going to have twins, but she does know that her pregnancy is difficult. There is turmoil inside of her. The Lord comes to her and says, what you will give birth to will be division. Not a very comforting message. And so the boys are born. Esau comes out first which means he's the primogenitor. He will inherit eventually the full wealth of the family. Close on his heels, literally grabbing a hold of his heel, is Jacob the younger, who will inherit nothing. We can imagine that the struggle in the womb continued through their youth as they were very different people. Esau liked to be outdoors hunting, Jacob liked to be in the tent spending time with his mother. When they were adults, the story goes on. The story goes on that Esau comes back from hunting and he's famished, he says, and he points to the edge of the tent, sees some food and says, give me some of that red stuff. And Jacob says to his brother, sure, sure, I will give it to you provided you sell me your birthright. Esau's rather impulsive and he can only see as far as his next meal. He says, sure, you can have my birthright. Just give me some of that red stuff. So he sells his birthright for a piece of bread and some lentil stew. And Jacob is now the older son. Not officially, he has to go to his father who is blind and doesn't know much in the fog of his old age. And and Jacob goes to his father and puts his hand out covered with animal hair and says, please bless me. And Isaac blesses Jacob, figuring that it's Esau, but it's not, it's Jacob. And it's now official. It's now official. Jacob is the inheritor of the family wealth, the family legacy. That story continues. Continues in the modern way recently because we as a people, white Europeans, have stolen the freedom. Have stolen the freedom of Africans, bringing them over here to this land to be enslaved for 250 years. The freedom now has been accorded to people who had previously been enslaved, but the cultural mindset is still that we own, white Europeans own their birthright and treat them with disrespect over and over again. Not only did we steal the freedom of a whole tribe of people, we stole the land of the people who were already here. And there are those who look at the American case files and either want to redact it, dismantle it, or ignore it, but that is where it is. The story continues with Jacob and Esau. Esau realized that he's been snookered by his brother, and he's furious, and he wants revenge. And Rachel, who is Jacob's mother and who favors Jacob warns Jacob and says you need to leave. You can go to my brother's place in a in a distant land and Jacob steals off and for decades he's removed from his original family. And he assembles his own family. In the course of time he is snookered by his father-in-law and he also cheats out his brothers-in-law of their wealth. This is a very thick case things reach a critical point later on a critical point later on when Jacob somewhat comes to himself and wants to atone for the deceit he's visited upon his brother and he says message to Esau that he wants a family meeting 
The message comes back to Jacob, yes, yes, let's have the family meeting. And Jacob is terrified. He's terrified figuring that Esau will exact revenge on not just Jacob, but his whole family. And so Jacob amasses his living wealth, his cattle, his camels, his goats, his sheep, and sends them out in waves to meet Esau, figuring that he can buy his brother off. And it seems to work, and then Jacob sees Esau coming with 400 men, and he's scared out of his mind. The story continues, the family meeting happens, and instead of revenge, Esau comes to his brother, falls on his neck, kisses him, and there is reconciliation. We might like to think that they lived happily ever after. Well, it's not quite the case. There was indeed reconciliation, but they had to work at it to enable it to endure. Buried within this case file is a a short snippet of a night that Jacob spends alone, the night before he meets his brother after all those years. He's alone on one side of the Jabbok River. He sent his family over the other side. He's alone there except in the middle of the night a man comes. Or is it an angel? Or is it God? And they wrestle all night long all night long, and at daybreak it becomes clear that Jacob is going to prevail. Yet, his hip is placed out of joint through the struggle, and he's left with a limp. A limp not just for that moment, but for the rest of his life. And as the wrestling ends, Jacob says to this man, or is it an angel, or is it God, you need to bless me. And this other, other person, angel, God, blesses Jacob. The story continues. Because especially in the past month or so, we have been wrestling with racism and prejudice. Ever since the death of George Floyd, One of the hopeful signs is we're hearing more stories. More stories from people who've been victimized, who've been demeaned, diminished, destroyed, denied. People are getting bolder in telling their stories. More stories are being told and people are listening to those stories. And their hearts and their minds are changing as a result of these stories. It calls to mind an experience I had nearly 30 years ago when I was rector of an urban church in New Jersey. It was right after the Rodney Rodney King uh, fiasco when Rodney King was arrested in Los Angeles, a black man pulled out of his car and beaten to a pulp by white police officers and they were cleared of any wrongdoing which set off riots and rage throughout the country. There was tension in the country, in the community, and certainly in the congregation. We decided we're going to have a forum. So we had a forum after church held in church. And we began to discuss our feelings and our thoughts and and, and what it is we should do as a Christian community in response. And at first, people were careful and guarded, all of which reflected kind of a resistance to go any deeper. But everything changed. The mood changed. When one of the wardens stood up, Jamaican woman, dentist, mother, stood up and in tears expressed her fear for her then seven-year-old son. She said, I'm worried that when he becomes 16, 17 and can be in a car, he will be pulled out and he will be beaten. He might even be killed. I'm scared of that. Her witness was real And it was raw. And for many of the white people in that forum, they were able to move from thinking about this issue as something they read about in the newspaper, heard about on the news, and now they heard the story. The story of fear told by a woman that they trusted and respected. 
And in that moment, I could see that people were becoming woke to the reality of our past, which extends into the present. How people's freedom has been stolen and denied and victimized. In the Gospel this morning, Jesus tells a story. A sower goes out to sow, sows seeds on rocky ground, on a path, in thorns, and on fertile ground. As you might expect, there are different outcomes from nothing growing on the rocky path to 50 to 100-fold growth in the good soil. I would submit to you that among the many seeds that Jesus sowed and continues to sow are the seeds of racial justice. And some of those seeds fall on rocky soil among people who say, well, we've been through this. That story is done. Get over it. I don't want to hear about it anymore. I don't want to change anything. And some of the seeds fall on the path And people hear the stories and and see the witness and their hearts are lifted for a moment and they say, black lives matter. But in the next moment they say, blue lives matter. And then they say, all lives matter. So the black lives matter shoots, get crowded out and die. And some seeds of racial justice are sown among the thorns, the thorns of of COVID pandemic and economic fragility, and people aren't able to see because of all the other things that are constricting, if not crippling. And then some seeds are sown among good soil, and there's great abundance, and there's flourishing. Over these past months, as the weather has gotten warmer, I have spent a lot of time in our garden in New Hampshire. And it is in good soil. It's been mulched and soil amendments have been added and a lot of time is taken and it is flourishing. And then there's the weeding. I need to weed. When I don't want to weed, I need to weed. And I wrestle with the weeds. I wrestle with the weeds as we, as a culture, we wrestle with racism. We wrestle with it. How does it affect us? And there are those of us who say, well, I I, I don't know about racism, but from the Jacob and Esau story, we learn that Jacob had a limp as a result of his wrestling. We, you and I, all of us have a limp as a result of the wrestling with racism. There are some who will say, I don't have a limp. Or I had a limp once and I don't have it anymore. If you think that you don't have a limp, think again. All of us learned, if not about racism, then certainly about prejudice. And where did we learn it? At the kitchen table or in the cafeteria on the playground or in church or a misreading of the Bible. We learned it somewhere. That some of us have a birthright that is more valuable and more important than someone else. There are genealogists who say that this prejudice has been bred into us. It is the virus of original sin. And the challenge for us, as it was for Jacob, is to acknowledge our limp as we continue to wrestle. That we have this limp, we have this wound which we carry with us. We can't deny it. We can't put it on the shelf. It won't go away. And the challenge is to know how it got there, how it works, and what we can do about it. We have to work at it to engage in reconciliation, if not reparation. The reparation will involve a lot more than camels, goats, and sheep. Acknowledge. Acknowledge the limp, the wound, this virus of original sin.
called prejudice and racism. We need to meet that. We need to acknowledge that. At the same time, we need to meet and acknowledge and celebrate the blessing. The blessing of life. There are a lot of blessings in the case files of the Jacob Esau family story. Lots of blessings. Jesus continues to offer his blessing to us even today. We need to acknowledge those blessings. How they help us with our limp. How they help heal and reconcile the world. That we as ministers, you and I, not just the ordained, all of us, have been commissioned to be bearers of the blessing. To be bearers of the blessing to a world that desperately needs it. May it be so. Amen. Let us say together the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We'll continue with the prayers of the people. During the prayers of the people, please add your own petitions silently or aloud. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant almighty God that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. We pray especially for those on our parish prayer list. Lord, in your mercy. We commend to your mercy all who have died that your will for them may be fulfilled and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy.
for all affected by coronavirus around the world, for the leaders of the nations, that they may work together for the common good as the outbreak spreads, that barriers that divide be brought down, that bonds of trust may be strengthened to benefit the entire human family. Lord, in your mercy. Grant public health and government officials in our nation the strength and will to act swiftly and decisively with wisdom and compassion and service to all. We pray especially for the President of the United States, the Congress, governors, elected officials in local municipalities, and Joseph, Mayor of City of Worcester. Lord, in your mercy. Heal those who are sick with the virus. May they have access to medical care and regain their strength and health. Grant them your healing grace. Give strength to all who are caring for loved ones. Lord, in your mercy for healthcare workers who, with hearts of service, stand on the front lines of providing care. Grant them courage and protection as they put the needs of public safety before their own. Lord, in your mercy. In our parish prayer list, we pray for all those celebrating birthdays this week especially Nana Mensa, Bryce Atukokwafio, Robert Ling Jr., Janet Mead Holly, John Butterworth, Robert Hunt, Sheila Tetler, Thomas Bishop, Elena Kearney, Brenna Miller. Keep us, good Lord, under the shadow of your mercy. Sustain and support the anxious. Be with those who care for the sick and lift up all who are brought low, that we may find comfort knowing that nothing can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Again, I want to welcome you to our service here at All Saints and invite you to not only to watch it as you are doing this morning, but also during the week if you prefer to watch church Sunday evening or on a weekday or week day afternoon or evening, um, you have different options and I commend them to you. As we get started with the service, I also invite you to receive communion later on. And if you want to have some bread and wine or juice nearby, that might help you. Some people find it very helpful and I commend it to you to try. If you do try, let us know how it goes. And I've asked the wardens to do the announcements and so they'll continue with those right now. Good morning, All Saints. This is David Lyko, your junior warden, and I have just a few brief announcements for you this week. Uh, you should have received a letter in the mail about our accessibility appeal. Uh, this is the capital campaign to raise funds to help us build the uh, ramp and the lift uh, to help people get around the building uh, easier. Uh, so we would love to have you contribute in that process by uh, making a donation. If you have not received that letter, please feel free to contact the office and Trish will help you with any details. 
Uh, we have our regular Wednesday noon meeting time, and that's set up for people to just have some social time together. And, uh, and so that will continue on. Uh, our evening, Wednesday evening services have, have gone away uh, for now. And, but uh, please feel free to participate in the even, evening Compline services um, hosted by the diocese for Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday evenings. And on Wednesday evenings, they are hosted by um, Right Reverend Mark Beckwith. And so please uh, feel free to participate in those services. And uh, please feel free to mail in your pledges, uh, or you can give online via Tithely. You can follow the link that's uh, being scrolled on, on your screen right now or also posted at the end of the service uh, to help us with uh, keeping our uh, expenses under control during this time. I uh, hope you have a great week, and it's great to see you, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, for you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin, into righteousness, out of death, into life. 
On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country, where with all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Jesus, gifts of God for the people of God. I join those of you who, are, who have the bread and wine at home. I invite you to join me with the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. 
The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you forever. Amen. Peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.